Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Greek Cypriot Brotherhood. Um, distinguished guests, Consul General of the Republic of Cyprus, Mr. Odysseus Odysseus, and of course our guest speaker this evening, Gibros Nikolaidis. On behalf of the Greek Cypriot Brotherhood, I would like to welcome you all to this evening's event that is being generously supported by the Cyprus Medical Society in the UK. For those of you that don't know, the Greek Cypriot Brotherhood is our community's oldest association, and next year we celebrate our 90th anniversary. Um, so for those of you that would like to join us or get involved, uh, do speak to me or any of the other committee members, Antonio or Anthony, who are standing over there, or Nino when he arrives, who's, who's our vice chair, um, about getting involved to support our cultural, educational, and political work. Tonight, we are... Um, distinguished to have with us Professor Gibros Nikolaidis. Um, Professor Nikolaidis, or Gibros as he prefers to be called, was born uh, in 1953 in Bafos and studied biochemistry and physiology followed by medicine at King's College and he graduated in 1978. During his studies he was very active in the Students Union here in the UK and regularly participated in rallies and events to demonstrate for a free United Cyprus. He has held the position of fetal medicine professor at King's College since 1992 and in 1995 founded and chaired the UK charity, the Fetal Medicine Foundation. He was also very recently featured in a Netflix documentary, The Surgeon's Cut, for his pioneering work on twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, as well as a number of other TV documentaries. And whilst Gibros has enjoyed significant professional success, he has never forgotten about our community, our UK Cypriot diaspora, and he's always been by the side of our diaspora. He's never forgotten about the ongoing Turkish occupation of Cyprus and has been a regular at events. And the radicalism that Gibros spoke about on the surgeon's cut has never really left him. Uh, Professor Nikolaidis was honoured by the Greek Cypriot Brotherhood when he first set up his foundation in the 90s and is a patron of the Cyprus Medical Society in the UK. More significantly, his awards include his recent election to the United States National Academy of Medicine, the Grand Cross of the Order of Magarios III, the Republic of Cyprus' highest civilian honour, the Eardley Holland Gold Medal for Outstanding Contribution to Science, and honorary doctorates from universities across the world. Now, in terms of the format of this evening's event, Professor Nicolaides will give us a 30-minute talk about his career through medicine, and then uh, I'll be joined by Effie, the Secretary of the Cyprus Medical Society in the UK, for a fireside chat with Gibros, and obviously anyone who would like to ask questions from the audience is welcome to do so as well. Without further ado, Professor Nicolaidis. Good evening. I'm going to talk in English, but I have to translate the slides in Greek. It is a great pleasure to be here tonight to be the speaker. I will cover some aspects of uh, my work. Okay. <laughs> I was reading tonight about maternal mortality. Maternal mortality is a, is a measure of the standard of healthcare in a, in a country. In sub-Saharan Africa, about one in a hundred women die as a result of pregnancy and its complications. In India, Bangladesh, um, Pakistan, it's about um, one in 300 women. In England, it's about one in 10,000 women. In Cyprus, somehow, 10 years ago, the rate was uh, 33 in 100,000. And in the last statistic, uh, in 2020, it was 68. And I'm not quite sure what has contributed to this increase in maternal mortality, but still. In England, a hundred years ago, the rate of maternal death was exactly the same as it is today in Bangladesh. And the reason for that is that you only had care during delivery if you were rich. Uh, the vast majority of the population were not rich. And this guy, an ecologist in, 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 um, uh, in Scotland, wrote in the British Medical Journal in 1900 so, uh, that we are not making all the necessary progress towards reducing the rate of maternal and perinatal mortality 
And I think the reason for that is that we are concentrating too much at the time of delivery for the rich, and many of the causes of maternal death and perinatal death precede the onset of labor. And the only thing that perhaps should happen is that we should have antenatal care for all women. Uh, and he recognized in this letter that many people will think that his ideas were unrealistic and too romantic. I think he underestimated the resistance and the conservative uh, attitude of the medical profession. They were not considering him to be uh, romantic and unrealistic. They were absolutely, completely hostile to his idea because they are, it was in their best interest that they continue to provide care for the rich because they got richer themselves. This is 1900. Now, at that time, there was a, a group of terrorists, like Hamas, are considered to be terrorists. And why? Because they were throwing bombs, they were chaining themselves on the House of Parliament, they were jumping in front of the horse of the king and they were getting killed. They were being arrested for being terrorists and they were going on, heart, uh, on uh, hunger strike my, like, like my father did. And they were putting these very thick uh, tubes down their throat and they were force feeding them. And when they survived and they were going out of prison, they were throwing a few more bombs. And the reason for that is that they were demanding the vote for women. We are now talking about 1900, 1910, 1920, 100 years ago. But women were quite intelligent. And they, uh, they didn't just ask for the vote as an arbitrary concept. We won the vote once every five years. And depending on the propaganda, we will vote for A or B. They were demanding that there should be a series of social reforms. And one of the social reforms that they wanted was pregnancy care for all pregnant women. Eventually, the poor conservatives gave them the vote, but you can't really trust women very much. Once they had the vote, they voted for the liberals, and the liberals won the elections in 1928-29, and one of the first actions of the liberal government was to introduce antenatal care for all women in this document. The year was 1929, and it was quite sexy for lawyers at the time that had uh, glasses to, to have this bent look. It looks quite <laughs> cool. So this lawyer, this lawyer in 1929 devised a method of pregnancy care. We should see women, he said, at around 16 weeks, because you can't really feel anything much before 16 weeks, and then see them at 24 weeks, and then every four weeks after that, and after, 20, after 28 weeks, see them every two weeks, and towards the end of the pregnancy, see them a lot. Why? Well, because you couldn't achieve anything very much there, and the pregnancy complications that you could actually do something about was actually to deliver the women, and therefore, you had to look after them a lot here. That was 100 years ago. In England, today, in the United States, and in all countries, they follow this sexy lawyer, <laughs> Minister of Health's pyramid of pregnancy care of 100 years ago. Now, I suggested that in the last 100 years, things have changed. And you can now actually see pregnant women and identify problems from the beginning of the pregnancy. And they suggested that we should turn the pyramid of pregnancy care upside down. Rather than run around like headless chicken trying to pick up the problems after they happen, we should see women a lot in the beginning, assess the individual woman's chances of developing problems, 
and on the basis of those chances, give them individual type of care, and therefore classify the problems in the beginning. And then we can see them again at around 20 weeks to reassess the risks, and then see everybody at 36 weeks. At King's College Hospital, women have a scan at 12 weeks, and then other at 20 weeks, and then other around 36 weeks. I have campaigned for the last 20 years that all women should also have a scan in the third trimester of pregnancy at 36 weeks, because in England we have one of the highest rates of perinatal mortality. We are amongst the worst in Europe and amongst the worst in the world. But they don't want to do that. They don't want to have a scan for all women in the third trimester. So they have a new, very sophisticated way of looking after pregnant women. They, now that their industry in dressmaking has gone bankrupt, they asked all of the dressmakers to give them a measuring tape. And therefore, we see women, and we measure something from here to somewhere down there. And this is the way in England by which we assess whether the baby is well or not. In all other societies with toilets and electricity, <laughs> women have a scan in the third part of pregnancy because some of the babies that would die, if we had a scan, we would find out that they're not growing well and we would deliver them earlier. So this is what I have been trying to achieve. Now, let me just, I will take a few examples of that. One of the commonest reasons why women have a scan in the beginning of the pregnancy is to find out whether they are carrying a baby with Down syndrome. In the old days, <coughs> now God knows how this will work. Ah. In the old days, we used to ask women, how old are you? And some economist in the 1970s drew a line at the age of 35 because England being a third world and poor country could only afford to offer an amniocentesis to about 5% of pregnant women. And the economist worked out that 5% of pregnant women coincided with the age of 35. There's nothing scientific about it. It was an economic decision. We can afford to pay for 5% of women having an amniocentesis, 5% coincided with the age of 35. So we call women one seven after the 35th birthday, you are an old woman, and one seven before that, you are a spring chicken. <laughs> and that is exactly the policy that we followed for several decades. Now, it is true that as a woman gets older, the chance of having a baby jumps increases. A woman at the age of 20 has a chance of one in a thousand, and a woman at the age of 50 has a chance of one in 10. But there's a hell of a lot of 20-year-olds that get pregnant for every 50-year-old, and therefore, the contribution of the younger age group is much greater than the contribution of the older age group. I hope you understand that. Yeah. As a consequence of that, we were missing 70% of the pregnancies with Downs because they were in the younger age group. Very, very simple. And the years passed by, and one day, a woman came, and her name is Cherry Rooms, and she had several babies that had died because she had a blood group, reasons negative, which is found in about 10% of white women. And her baby, because of her husband, was carrying, it was reasons positive. In these cases, contrary to the common belief that the mothers love their children, in reality, the mothers are constantly trying to kill their children, at least before they're born. And in this case, the mother was recognizing the baby as a foreign body, and she was developing antibodies to cross the placenta and attack the baby's blood and to try to kill it. And the babies were indeed dying because their blood was being destroyed by their mother. So she came to me at 16 weeks in her pregnancy because I didn't think that these antibodies can kill a baby before 16 weeks. And 
the baby had already died. So I said, don't worry. Next time, come to me at 12 weeks, and I will do a scan, and I will take a piece of marrow from your bones, because she is rhesus negative, and inject it into the baby to make the baby a bit rhesus negative so that you cannot destroy it with your own antibodies. But when she arrived at 12 weeks, I did a scan, the, the ultrasound machines were terrible then, but you could still see that this blackness is a lot more than that blackness. I said, wow, this baby is already dying from these antibodies, which is against everything that I knew in the previous 10 years. But at that time, I was doing some other research where I was taking a sample of fluid from around the baby, amniocentesis, that is called, or from the placenta, chorionic virus sampling, that is called. I was comparing which is safer to do to test for basic downs. Because of that research, and this woman had already aged because of the many years where her babies were dying, uh, because of this research, I did a, an amniocentesis, and two days later I got the results. <coughs> the baby had Down syndrome. So I said, being perfidious, <laughs> it would it be that I was not wrong the previous 10 years, that it is impossible to kill a baby with these antibodies at 12 weeks, and therefore the reason why this baby had this fluid was because it was in heart failure, because some of the babies with Downs are in heart failure. Actually, one in three babies with Downs that we see at 12 weeks die before they are born. And maybe this was one of those. It's amazing when you notice something, then you begin to see it. And you may look at something for 10 years and you don't see it, but then suddenly when you see it, you see it, you show it. The next day, I had another woman, and again I got the results. If I was not doing research, comparing these two tests, and I was waiting for this woman to deliver. Either a dead baby, and nobody would know why the baby died, it's from God, or nine, six, seven, eight months later, the baby had Downs. I would never have connected the two. But because of the research, I connected them because I had the results the next two days. At that time, a lot of journalists were coming to see me because this was a new field, and everybody was very excited. They wanted to know whether they could write something about it. There was quite an attractive woman called Valentine that came from Scotland, and she wanted to know if there was a story. So I took her to the kebab house where I take people because it's quite cheap, <laughs> and uh, I said, I think I have a story. And she said, what is the story? I said, it's this. But she said, well, how can you find out if it is true? And I looked at her in the eyes, and my main objective was to seduce her. And therefore I said, I need to examine 100,000 women. Why 100,000? I just felt like that that was a, a nice seduction line. And uh, she said, wow, um, 100,000. She said, where even 20 is 100,000 women? I said, it depends on you. On that Sunday Times, there was a photograph advertising this, that every day, from the morning until midnight, Saturday including Sunday, any woman, that had nice legs could walk up nine <laughs> floors to come to my unit which was the ninth floor of King's College Hospital. We had two lifts and usually they didn't work. So they could come for a scan. And by uh, 1998, we had now examined 100,000 women. When you have 100,000 women, because Downs is found in about one in 500 pregnancies, you need 100,000 so that you have enough of a sample to make any real connections between the two. That is what happened. And uh, a few years later, this is how the machines look like, and this is what this black space behind the neck looks like. This is how many we used to pick up by the previous method, and this is how we could now pick up with a new method, 90%. Because you also found that in Down's pregnancies, two hormones were different from those without Down's. Now, I published this in The Lancet in 1998. You would have thought that, at that time, they would come and tell me, congratulations, this is fantastic, this is a major breakthrough. 
the consequence of these publications is that they stopped inviting me to give lectures at the Royal College of Obstetricians. They didn't want to hear about this because, of course, I was challenging an established system. And the government, they were saying, we don't have enough evidence. There are very few things in medicine that you acquire 100,000 cases to prove your point. They said, we don't have enough evidence. So what happens then that this major breakthrough becomes part of clinical service? How, how do you do that? They say that the interval between a major scientific discovery in medicine and its clinical implementation is about 20 years. The discovery to clinical 20 years. Why? Well, Genesis, the very group that should be supporting you by definition are your competitors, so they make absolute issues. And while you're doing research, they are sitting in royal colleges and they acquire co important positions in various committees, so they have the ability to stop anything from happening. And then, of course, you have economic considerations because the government says, it's quite cheap to ask me how old are you, dear, uh, and instead to do an ultrasound scan, because you are not doing any scans at that stage in pregnancy, then you take a blood scan. So how, 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 what do you do? It so happens that women from 1970, when these were worked out, to 1990, did something that challenged us men for good or for bad. They started going to universities. They started becoming members of parliament. They started becoming lawyers and politicians and so on. And to do so, you need to be about 35 years old. That is the time at which you begin to have an important position of power, whether you're a politician or a lawyer or a doctor or whatever it is that you are. So these women that have now delayed having their babies were already classified as being old. And the last thing in the world that they want to do is have an amniocentesis, thesis. And they were demanding that they have this test because many of those would not end up having an invasive test which could kill their babies. And therefore, it was not the Lancet, it was not the Royal College of Obstetricians, it was the women's magazines that created a pressure group that 100 years later, and that's why I started my lecture with the suffragettes, they made the change. It was these organizations that demanded the change, and not 20 years later, but in 2006, so it's only uh, eight plus six. Only 14 years later, one day, they called me and they said, we have decided in three months from now to offer this test in all women in this country. I said, and we need yourself. I said, bastards. <laughs> for 14 years, for 14 years, they were saying that there's not enough evidence. This cannot be done. It should not be done. They were telling me that women do not come for a scan. They don't come to the hospital before 16 weeks, and I said, but why are there so really stupid women? Usually, from the age of 12 or so, you start having a period every month or so, and when you get pregnant, you stop having a period, so if you are not completely stupid, you realize that maybe you are pregnant, and if you don't realize that you think that you may be pregnant, you start vomiting, so that God makes you think that you are pregnant. <laughs> why is it that in England, unlike every other country of the world, it takes four months before you realize that you may be pregnant? and you come to the hospital. It is because the sexy lawyer in 1929 told them that you must only come to a hospital at 16 weeks. That's all. So when he told them come at 12 weeks, they came. The years went by, and then, uh, ah, this is also, up. this is also interesting. That was in 1992. In the meantime, we were looking at these babies and we were realizing that if you have Down syndrome, they have a small, beautiful nose. And therefore, at 12 weeks, you there, that's the nasal bone, white, if I have some this bone, it's a nasal bone, but these babies did not have a nasal bone. If you look at their heart, normally, this is the way of form that you get. In these babies, they have a leaky valve in their heart. Quite often, there is a Down's heart. 
abnormal hearts. And if you look at a blood vessel which is very special, that is the nosis it's called, you have a waveform which is like this, where one wave merges with the next one, and in those babies, quite often, there was a gap between the waves. So we introduced this, and we then jumped up from the 90% to the 97%. Every month, and that is what we were doing at King's, we are offering this scan. Every month, the chief executive of King's, which I think is an oil executive, received a letter from the National Screening Committee that we were doing things outside the guidelines. Because the guidelines said that my test of 20 years before is what should be done in the whole country. And you could not be doing things outside the guidelines. So every month I had to go and say, but it is much better, this test. It didn't matter. I didn't care. They kept telling me off. And they carried on doing this test. So I keep mentioning these things to show ah, to show that what Christo started off with, my training in Cypriot and international politics from the 1970s was critical for my career and for my scientific development. Because in the 1970s, when I was in the medical school, and you had to learn how to do histology, pieces of meat under the microscope, pharmacology, incomprehensible formulas, anatomy, cutting dead people with the smell of formalin, and all of those things were of no interest to me at all. What was of interest to me is that the great democratic country called America made absolutely sure that every single Latin American country had a fascist dictatorship, including beyond Latin America, Greece, Turkey, and some of the other European countries. And to me, that was far more important to demonstrate against fascism rather than learning how to cut dead bodies. I was going to the medical school for the last two or three months every year so that I could catch up some ideas so that I could pass to the next year. So that is that. The years went by and people realized in the last 10 years that when the cells of our body die, the nucleus, the center of the cell that contains the DNA, the DNA breaks up and comes out of the cells. So we call it cell-free DNA, DNA outside the cells. And when the placenta that feeds the baby grows, it's a very active organ, and it, it, it dies, it rejuvenates itself, and it's very active. And about 10%, 10%, which is a hell of a lot, of the DNA in the mother's blood comes from this blob, the baby, which is extraordinary. So there's a massive amount of DNA coming from the baby into the mother. And when you analyze this blood from the mother, you can now diagnose 99.7% of the babies with Downs. In Belgium, in Holland, uh, all women are offered this test. In Switzerland and in Germany, if you are risk from my original test, it's about one in a thousand or more, you are offered this test. In a very third world country, like the United Kingdom, only if your risk is more than one in a hundred, you are offered this test, so that the test is only offered to between 2 and 5% of the population, because England is a poor country. And then we used to do a scan at 20 weeks to look for any fetal abnormalities. And suddenly, when we were finding that the fluid behind the neck is very big, and we were testing the babies for downs, and the babies did not have downs, and the pregnancies were carrying on, the babies had a lot of other things that were wrong with them. There was something wrong with their heart and various other parts of their body. And the higher the amount of fluid behind the neck, the higher the amount of fluid behind the neck, the greater was the chance 
that the baby could have had Downs or a chromosomal abnormality, but if the baby did not have a chromosomal abnormality, the greater was the chance that the baby had something else wrong with it. So we had the baby in front of us, and we were therefore beginning to look for many other things than just the collection of fluid behind the neck. The National Screening Committee said, we have five minutes to do a scan in which we measure the length of the baby from the bum to the top of the head and measure the fluid behind the neck. It doesn't really matter if the baby does not have a head. The objective of the scan is to look at the neck. And it doesn't matter whether it is a headless neck or not. But we are seeing that we could diagnose a lot of things from the 12-week scan. A student of mine who is looking much older than me now is called Aris Papayoriu. He's a very important professor uh, in St. George's and uh, at the, in Oxford, and he's the editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Obstetrics and Ecology. 30 years later, they did an examination of the evidence of what abnormalities you could actually see at the 12-week scan, and he's now pushing that what we said we could do 30 years ago should be adopted for the whole country, and maybe it will, maybe it will not. One of the commonest fetal abnormalities is having a spina bifida. These are words that I found on Google for the Greeks. <laughs> spina bifida is we have bones in our back, and we have the nerves run from our brain all the way down to the bum. And at each level, nerves come out to supply our top and various parts of the body. If the bone is missing somewhere, and the nerves stick out, the amniotic fluid around the baby at a certain point becomes toxic and damages the nerves. And from that point onwards, it's like if you had a car accident, if you are paralyzed from the legs downwards, from, from that point downwards, you are paralyzed in the legs and you are incontinent of urine and feces. And because the fluid is escaping, less than the prospana fluid, it's escaping from this hole. And this is connected to the brain. There is decompression of the brain. The fluid comes out, and the brain is pulled down. So one day, when I was younger, I saw a baby. And I thought that the baby looked odd. Instead of the head having this shape, it had a shape like this. And I said, this looks like the lemons that we had in our back garden in Paphos. And the back of our brain has two balls on top of each other that coordinates our movements. And that is called the cerebellum. And in this baby, the cerebellum, instead of being two balls on top of each other, was pulled down and just it looked like a banana. We didn't have any bubbles, but they had them imported in other parts of Cyprus. So I said, wow, there's a lemon and a banana. I said, I wonder, and that baby had spina bifida. So I looked up about 30 photographs that we had stored from previous babies that were diagnosed with spina bifida. And indeed, I thought that there was a very clear relationship between spina bifida and lemons and bananas. So I wrote this paper in The Lancet, and the editor wrote back to me, he said, are you crazy? Are you sending a paper in a scientific journal you're talking about lemons and bananas as if this was a supermarket marketing buffers. I said, please, what do you want me to do? Say that this is Arnold Chiari malformation type 2. Nobody in the world would know what it means. So he was intelligent enough, they are not anymore, to recognize that it was useful to call it lemons and bananas. And that's how it was published. And that is the method by which people look at uh, babies now to diagnose spina bifida. In a primitive country like the United States of America, this was in 1986. In 2017, they were still doing a different test to find out if the baby had spina bifida, and they were very much opposed to this. The Royal College of Obstetricians stopped inviting me to give lectures when I was talking about lemons and bananas because they said, what, what, this, is not, this is a very high scientific organization. We don't talk about things like that. Uh, but that is a method by which people look for babies with spina bifida. In the meantime, as we moved on in the years 
subsequently, when we were doing a scan now, at 12 weeks, these lemurs and bananas did not exist. But in the same cut that you have of the baby, this is the profile, this is the bone of the nose, and this is the fluid behind the neck. In the same cut that you do that, if you don't go in a straight line, because I was quite stupid, for 10 years, my brain was saying, get this view, looks very beautiful, press the button, give a picture to the mother to remember, ask them to call the baby keeper if it's born, and and tell them that the baby looks all right, because this is all right, and that is all right. But imagine how stupid I was. I was going like this a hundred thousand times. And all I had to do is do that. Because if I had done that, I would have seen the back of the brain. In the back of the brain, there are two lines in normal babies, but in babies who start with that, there's only one line. Ten years of stupidity. Me. That, therefore, now is the sign that they may have spanked and can diagnose that at the 12th week of pregnancy. In the meantime, we have published hundreds of thousands of pregnancies of the scan at 12 weeks, which show all of the major abnormalities that can be diagnosed at that time. And I hope that, thanks to Aris Babayu, who is much more polite than me, much more anglicized, much more part of the system, it is possible that 30 years on, this method will be adopted as part of a routine scanning pregnancy. Now, let me talk about preeclampsia. This beautiful woman, I was in a lecture in the Royal College a few months ago. There was some woman that was saying, you cannot tell a woman that she's beautiful. But I said, but if she's beautiful, what do you tell her that you're ugly? But she said, you don't say anything. I said, well, this woman is beautiful. She's a beautiful black woman. She's an Olympic athlete, American, unfortunately. She's an Olympic athlete. She got four, four gold medals. On April the 23rd, a couple of weeks after my birthday, she died. She's young, she's 32 years old, she's beautiful, she's athletic, and she died because of preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is the development of high blood pressure in pregnancy. Everybody knows Downs, but very few people know preeclampsia unless somebody in their family had developed it. Now, it is the biggest cause of death in women and babies in the world. More than 46,000 women die every year because of this condition. And more than half a million fetuses and babies die because of this complication of pregnancy. Now, in England, the method of trying to identify women as to whether they will develop preeclampsia is when we see women in the beginning of the pregnancy, we get a packet of cigarettes out where we have written 10 questions, and we ask those 10 questions, and if the answer to any of those 10 questions is yes, they say, aha, you are at high risk of developing preeclampsia. So as far as preeclampsia screening, the biggest cause of death in pregnancy in the world, we are somewhere in about 50 years ago, as we were in screening for Downs. It's cheap, it's a few questions. If you are really stupid, write them down, so you don't, you don't forget them. And it takes a few seconds to ask the questions. But how good is it as a method of finding out whether the woman is really at risk? Nobody cares about that. Because the institutions have a few important people they get together, they sit in expensive restaurants, they usually have expensive wine, and they speak in a funny language most of the time, and then they come up with guidelines and recommendations. Believe it or not, often that is the case. And they don't really need to justify the recommendations. They say, this is the method of identifying the high risk group. <coughs> so, I said, but how good is it? It doesn't really matter because it is from the Royal College of Singapore, so it must be good. I said, I doubt it very much. It would be good if it's, that's where it's coming from. We found out by examining several thousands of women that we classify wrongly as high risk about 10% of the population, one in 10 women, and that group contains only 40% 
of the women that we developed preeclampsia. So before we blink, we missed 60% of the cases. The years went by. And I used the same logic as I had for dams. I said, why don't you combine the how old are you and those questions with what does the blood flow from the mother to the baby feel like at the 12 weeks come, look at the blood flow, and why not measure the blood pressure of women, and also measure a hormone in the same blood sample where we measure the hormones for screening for Down syndrome. It, it costs about five dollars for this blood sample. Five dollars, we have 600,000 deliveries, uh, six, uh, six pounds, is 600,000 deliveries in England, it's about three million uh, pounds a year to identify 90% of the most severe types of preclamps that kill women and their babies. But three million pounds we don't have. We have to give a lot of rockets to, to Ukraine, and you have to give a lot, a lot of money to that guy that went to a desert in Australia, in, in Australia and he started eating the penis of kangaroos so that he becomes very famous as an actor. What was the name of that? Hancock. Hancock. <laughs> who wasted 8.7 billion pounds because of his incompetence or corruption. 8.7 billion wasted pounds in mismanaging people that were dying partly because of him and the jerk above him from COVID. 8.7 million, but they don't have 3 million for this. I have, have spoken for more than three, half an hour. If I carry on talking like this and somebody is listening, they will send me back to Bafos. <laughs> <laughs> so I did a study and we picked up seven hospitals, NHS hospitals in England, uh, 16,500 women, and you had a head-on comparison of the pink, this nice, like chocolate milkshake, um, <laughs> of the institutions in England against the triple test, blood pressure, Doppler, and present growth. It was twice as good at each type of preeclampsia. Twice as good. Now, what shall we do? We found out now, effectively, who are the women at risk. Obstetricians have a sadomasochistic desire in their importance to punish their patients. So whatever condition they have, they ask them to stay in bed. It helps in nothing but nothing at all. In Greece, they have a scan at 12 weeks, especially with their civil servants, they find some black things behind the placenta. They say, you must stay in bed for the rest of your life. Time and the government can carry on paying for you because you have apocalypse, a condition that I don't know about. <laughs> apocalypse, stay in bed. Well, if you stay in bed, your nose grows. Your legs become atrophic. I know. I was in bed for two days. And when I stood up, I fell down. Because you cannot stand up. You, 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 you are disorientated. You stay in bed. And there's a good chance that you will die from doing so, because in pregnancy, the blood becomes more coagulable. You have a tumor here called the pregnancy, which is preventing the blood flow coming probably from your legs up. And you're staying in bed. The ideal scenario for developing clots in your veins, and then you stand up and they go into your lungs and you're kaput. It helps for nothing, in obstetrics at least. And then, don't work too much, it's fine. Uh, don't take salt and take lots of tablets. And in underdeveloped countries like Cyprus and Greece and Turkey and Egypt and so on, all women are walking around like this because they carry a bag full of vitamins and all sorts of tablets <laughs> that are of no use whatsoever for anything except for enriching their obstetricians who are really good because they get them all these tablets. So in their life, even that anything goes wrong, they say, you didn't take all of the tablets. <laughs> uh, nothing works. 
there's one thing that does. And that thing is something which is extremely expensive. You can buy it from the local petrol station. <laughs> it is generally safe. Uh, it's called aspirin. Um, but how do you find how to do that was true? So we did this test in 27,000 women. We found out the high risk group, and then we just randomly allocated them. The computer told us this woman takes a tablet that looks like aspirin, but is not aspirin, and this woman takes a tablet which is aspirin. And we carried on. And then we found that in the group that received this aspirin, we reduced the chances of getting the most severe type of preeclampsia, the one that kills women and babies, by nearly 90%. We reduced the risk by 60% for preterm preeclampsia, but we didn't have too much of an impact in term preeclampsia, which is not so important anyway. You would have thought. And that paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. In medicine, you have the Brixton Weekly, that's one standard, and then you have the Lancet, and then above the ceiling is called the New England Journal of Medicine. So it could not have been published anywhere more important. What do you think happened in response to this? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Another thing that is important, the biggest cost of pregnancy care is not looking after women, it's looking after their babies. It costs every day that we stay in the neonatal unit uh, two and a half thousand pounds every day. Every day. And the biggest cost of staying in the neonatal unit is birth before 32 weeks. But I told you before in the previous slide that aspirin, this extremely expensive uh, medication <laughs> that, uh, that makes uh, billions for the pharmaceutical industry, uh, reduces that by 90%. Most of the reasons why they stay in the neonatal unit is because they are born before the twist. This is the group of women that receive the placebo, and this is the group of women that receive aspirin. So we were reducing the rate of stay in the neonatal unit by nearly 70%. Look here. 2,500 pounds per day in the neonatal unit. For any baby that's born very prematurely, multiply that by several days, it adds up to a minimum of 100,000 pounds per baby. And look on in these babies, because many would have developed brain hemorrhages, they would have had various handicaps because they were born very prematurely. Look at the cost for a healthcare system for the rest of their life, and it is three billion pounds every year. And all I'm asking them is to spend three million, not billion, and we nearly eliminate that. It's too complicated. So, there's a technique in medicine that for those that are studying medicine now and those that are new doctors, or a bit older, they think there's a propaganda that the ultimate level in medicine is called a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is where you use a statistical technique where you put all of the previous studies together and then you mix them up and you come up with a conclusion. And that is the ultimate level in medicine. I call it spaghetti la carbonara, <laughs> take away by a Chinese cook and a Greek waiter. <laughs> they take studies that are completely heterogeneous, completely different outcomes, completely different treatments, and they put them in a pot, and they get a mathematician to make certain mathematical manipulations, and they come up with evidence in medicine. Let me give you an example, and then if you are completely fed up, I can stop, and if you are a little bit fed up, I can carry on. <laughs> this is called Cochrane Library. It is the Bible of evidence in medicine. Okay. The perfect level of medical evidence. So, they did various studies, 60 of them, millions of wasted pounds or dollars or euros to do studies. 
in most of the studies, the dose of aspirin was dependent on the dose of aspirin in the local petrol station. So, if you're in Brazil, the local petrol station sells aspirin, which is 60 milligrams. If you're in the United States, it is 81 milligrams. If you are in England, it is 75 milligrams. So instead of giving a proper dose to the high-risk group, they were giving whether their local petrol station attendant was telling them to do for the various studies. 54 out of the 60 studies were giving an inadequate amount of aspirin. We said that aspirin should be given in the beginning of the pregnancy, before 14 weeks, because that is the gestation at which the placenta is developing. And if you give it later, it doesn't work because it's too late. So what did they do? In 46 of the 60 studies, they gave it whenever the woman happened to be in the toilet of the local hospital for a pee. So if a woman turned up in the hospital at 32 weeks, they gave it at 32 weeks. If she turned up at 38 weeks in labor, in the beginning of labor, they were giving the aspirin at that point. In the vast majority of studies, they okay, the aspirin at the wrong time. The definition of preeclampsia in the 60 studies, in 40 studies, it was completely different between each other. But don't worry. Cholematic addition, put them together, mix them up, and come up with a conclusion that aspirin reduces the rate of preeclampsia by 15%. So it's not necessary for us to introduce an effective method of aspirin. So the highest level of evidence in medicine sets us back and kills women by 40 years. So, let me quickly now tell me, are you fed up? No. Would you dare say yes if you were? <laughs> okay. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. I told you that preeclampsia is the main cause of death in women. The main cause of handicap in babies and death in the neonates is premature death. Nothing to do with Downs or anything else. Perfectly normal babies that are fed up with being in there and they drop out too early. And that is the main cause of death. Let me show you a map that is very interesting for your education. It was interesting for me. This is purple, dark purple, is very bad. This grayish is good. Let us look at the countries of the world where the main cause of death in babies is premature birth. And try to begin to think of why that should be the case. If you are in Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, forget about it. You are born to die. Very high risk. If you are in Sub-Saharan Africa, you are also born to die. And the reason for here that women dying or the babies dying and premature birth is because of inadequate nutrition, inadequate health. I went to India once, there were four women in one bed delivering at the same time. At the same time, the ones that come to England and they get the MRCOG, they open private clinics to do IVF and to help the rest of the population. That is India, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Here it is. In Africa, they have diamonds, they have oil, they have American and English companies that go and take that, and then they leave them behind with dictatorships, and they're completely non-existent healthcare. I sent Anastasia and two other people two weekends ago to Ethiopia, because we had an agreement with Dan Diaz when he was a Greek foreign minister, that there are certain countries that are important for Greece to develop good relationships. They are the countries where Turkey is completely dominant. They are called North Macedonia, Albania, Kosovo, um, uh, Moldavia, and Armenia. So those were important countries. And in Africa, it was Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Rwanda. So I said, okay, we are going to send people there. I'm going to cover their expenses. We will set up a unit fetal medicine, that will give them machines that are a bit higher standard than the ones that I have at King's. So they went there and they spent a few days and they came back and they were pathologically depressed. Because you now have this unit with really good machines. You have people that are desperate 
to learn, you can walk outside the clinic, and you see women delivering on the floor in a hospital. They make this one the main university hospital, and there's no water. And you step out of that, and you have a disaster. But you're not allowed to step out too much because they have another civil war. And, and then you just wonder, what is the hope for humanity? This is this part. Who knows which one is this country? Mexico? Argentina? Which is this underdeveloped country in the world that goes around killing everybody throughout the world to impose democracy as they understand it? It has one of the highest perimeter mortalities in the world. The United States of America. But why? They're rich. Yes, if you're rich, you're rich. If you belong to the one third of the population, especially the blacks, the very group that died for preeclampsia, the very group that had written birth, you have no health care here, and it doesn't really matter what happens to you. That is that. So, in tackling this problem in medicine, say, what, what can I do? This needs a social revolution. It doesn't need doctors. It doesn't mean, need me to send doctors to Ethiopia to give them expensive machine. It needs a complete change. But you cannot do that. The years have passed. It's too late for that. We could do some things in some countries. A few... There's a lot of things in 1990. I used to be intelligent those years. <laughs> we found that the uterus has a sphincter at the bottom. That is called the cervix. And the baby is kept in there because this sphincter is closed. But this, this sphincter, for one reason or another, is weak. When it begins to open up, the baby drops out. But it doesn't start from here, and the next morning at 9 o'clock it does that. It is in a process of opening up. <coughs> so if at the routine, ultrasound scan that all women should have at 20 weeks, we spend a few more seconds and we measure, measure the length of the cervix, we could predict a very high proportion of those women that will deliver prematurely. And the shorter the cervix, the greater is the chance that you will deliver very prematurely. You would have thought that that should become part of routine care. It's only uh, who is good in mathematics? 2023 minus 1998, 23 plus another, another two, it's just 25 years. But that was not enough. What should we do if the cervix is getting short? Why? You can go to church and pray. Um, you can arrange for the funeral of your baby that's going to die. Reasonable. <coughs> Or you can try and stitch the cervix to see whether you can stop it from opening up any further. But you did studies like that, and we found that in doing so, we reduce the chances by about 30%. Or you can take this drug, it's progesterone, it's natural, it's a natural hormone that all women produce every month, and you can take one of these pessaries, which is extremely cheap, you can just stick it in the cell, in the vagina every night after 20 weeks, and then in another of those publications in the Brixton Weekly called the New England Journal of Medicine, in 2007, we showed that we can reduce dramatically the chances that the woman will deliver prematurely. You would have thought that that would have made a difference. One day, maybe. Why? Who goes into premature labor? We are black. We are poor. If you live in Brixton, so who cares? I'm not going to do any of that. So over the years, in addition to diagnosing problems, we have developed methods by which we could try to treat some of the babies. In those babies that I started my lecture with, the woman has antibodies that destroy the baby's blood. The baby becomes anemic and dies. We just put a needle inside the uterus. We take a blood sample from the umbilical cord of the baby, and we squirt in a bit of blood. 
Two to out every three weeks, and more than 90% of the babies that used to die, now they don't. Sometimes you do a scan and you find collections of fluid in the lungs, in the, in the, in the, in the abdomen, in the bladder, and you just wonder, can you do something to prevent the lungs from being compressed, which would interfere with their development? And the answer is yes, just, just, just stick a needle in, and there are little plastic tubes, and you stick one end of the tube inside the chest, and the other end of the tube outside, and the fluid drains outside from the lungs into the fluid around the tube. And then, that was the subject of, uh, of the Netflix movie, One Midnight in 1992. We had this couple that came from Norwich Hospital with this condition of two to two species. They say that the identical twins love each other. It's completely wrong. They try to kill each other from the beginning to the end of their life. So, in utero, they have connecting blood vessels between them, and blood goes from one baby into the other. Now, if they are fair to each other, and you give blood this way, and you take blood back the same amount of blood, you are right. But quite often, some of them are greedy, they receive blood and they don't want to give it back, and the stupid one that loses blood dies because of lack of oxygen and food, and the greedy one dies because of heart failure because it has too much blood. So, what can you do? We were watching these babies die. But we were only watching these babies die because we introduced a scan because of the new car in the 12th week of pregnancy. In the old days, when they wanted us to do a scan in 20 weeks, we didn't see this condition, it did not exist. The women were already miscarrying before they arrived at 20 weeks. Now the papers that you wrote is the hidden mortality of identical twins, because they were dying before you could see them. But suddenly now, people are following them up and they see how one baby is getting too much blood and the other not enough. What we were doing is we put, we used to put needles inside the uterus and drain the extra fluid that the recipient baby was taking. It's like when you go to the pub and you drink a lot, you pee a lot. So the baby that was receiving too much blood was peeing a lot, and there was a lot of fluid around it, and the baby that was losing blood was stopping to pee, and there wasn't much fluid around it. So all we were doing is sticking a needle inside the uterus to drain the extra fluid and watch the babies die. It's like taking aspirin for the headache because you have brain secondaries from your lungs. And one night we thought that perhaps a better way of dealing with things is to put a telescope inside the uterus and use laser to cut the connecting blood vessels. And that's what we did. And uh, my students at that time, a guy called Evil, who also appears in the, in the movie, He's the top surgeon in France, and another guy who looks very conservative because he's Germanic, uh, Kurt Hecke. Uh, I gave a lecture in his living party because he, his people don't like to work too much uh, and feel tired. And that was the biggest surgeon in, 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 in Germany. So this is done everywhere. Also, sometimes you find tumors in the, in the lungs, and there, if you do a scan, you find the blood supply to the tumor, and you put a needle in, into the blood vessel, and you use laser, you cut off the blood supply, and, this shrink, and the tumor shrink, shrinks up. Now, we have a membrane here, which separates our chest, which contains the heart in the middle, and the lung on each side, and our gut. And our gut has a liver on this side, and the stomach, and a lot of power, especially if you eat well. Um, Sometimes there's a hole in this membrane and gut and liver go up into the chest. But the chest is a bony box. And if things go up, there's not enough space for everybody. And therefore, the gut compresses the lungs and the lungs don't develop so well. And you don't need lungs when you're inside the uterus because you get your oxygen from your ambulatory cord. But as soon as the cord is cut and the baby is born, and the lungs are not developed, the baby cannot breathe, they die. In these cases, we put a telescope inside the uterus and we put a balloon in the throat. What a madness. 
Why do we do that? Because the lungs in utero produce fluid, and this fluid is constantly escaping into the amniotic cavity. If we block that, the fluid is retained in the lungs, the lungs are stretched, and the stretch makes them grow and develop. So we did that in 2002 in a woman called Sophocleus. Sophocleus is from Cyprus. She did not have any baby. She tried for many, many years. She was 45 years old. She eventually got pregnant. And they called me from Cyprus to say, unfortunately, because they're good doctors in Cyprus. They get paid too much, three times as much as we get paid in England. That's why they're going to go bankrupt, but it doesn't matter. They will realize sooner or later. Three times as much, the average GP in Cyprus. Um, and they complain. It's part of our culture. <laughs> so, can you do something? I said, I don't know. There's a friend of mine in Belgium who's completely mad, and he doesn't like humans, because the Belgians are a bit <laughs> like that. That's why I do the European Union there, because you don't have too many emotions. Um, but he's really good with rats and, 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 and sheep. And they are doing these experiments where they are putting telescopes inside the uterus and they keep blocking the trachea of these poor animals. And they found that the lungs grow. So I said, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to give him a ring to bring in some of the instruments that they use for the rats and the, and the rabbits. And we'll see whether they can put a balloon inside the baby's throat, whether that would improve things. I did not have the faintest idea of how to do it or what the consequences of that would have been. I said, we'll try because there's no other option. She came. And because I was afraid that something could go wrong during this procedure, I made a big mistake. We often do that in medicine. I decided to do this operation at 34 weeks, so that if anything went wrong, at least we could quickly deliver the baby. And if it was to survive, it could survive. In reality, we knew from the animal studies that I should be doing it at 26 weeks, but if anything goes wrong at 26 weeks, the baby's dead. So we did the right operation at the wrong stage because I was afraid. Nobody died, it went very well. The pregnancy continued, but the baby died because we left it too late for the lungs to grow. In the subsequent pregnant women, we did it after six weeks. And it took us 10 years. This is the Greek Trojan War. Ten years of messing around until we perfect the technique to know exactly what is the best way of putting balloons in the throat. And at the end of that, everywhere we went, and we said, this is a good thing. They were telling us, and what is your evidence that it works? So then we embarked on the trip of, of his sales back to Italy, another ten years, where we now had to do a trial where we were randomizing the women that were coming along into either having the balloon or not having the balloon. And um, two years ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine, we published a paper that we now know that putting a balloon in the baby's throat can treble the chances of the baby surviving. Now, spina bifida is that condition that we saw in the spine, the nerves being exposed. And there is a lot of interest now that perhaps if we go inside the uterus and we operate on these babies and we cover up the hole in the spine and we cover and protect the nerves, we will prevent the baby from becoming paralyzed and incontinent. There's some evidence from animal studies that that could be the case and we started doing that. Um, it would take a few years before we know whether that is beneficial or not. But I think the time has come to drink a bit of water. Thank you. First question, thank you. One of the 
deans of the medical school of Kings told me once that a discovery is like the wave in the sea, and it appears that we made a discovery when the wave hits a rock, and that the, the, the wave breaks. So the discovery doesn't come on its own. It comes from a lot of work from many other people. 40 years ago, a guy in Paris took 100 women that were at very high risk of preeclampsia, and at 12 weeks, he gave them 150 milligrams, and in 50 women, he gave the, uh, the aspirin, 150 milligrams from 12 weeks, and none of them developed preeclampsia, and in the 50 that he did not, many developed preeclampsia. In the subsequent years, the 40 wasted years of medicine that I showed there, anybody gave any doses, any time, and, and whatever. And when, I, when, he, when he discovered the new method of identifying the high-risk group, I said, let me go back 40 years and do things properly for a change. Uh, we will start at 12 weeks, we will identify properly the high-risk group, and we'll give them aspirin. And it worked, and it's cheap, and it's generally safe, and I take it every day. Should I not? <laughs> the second question about the destiny of the, of the people. You're right. Uh, and that is true for this, this one. Are we messing around? And are we abusing the desire of women to do anything to save their baby? I saw a woman this afternoon from Romania, a builder, a, a, a cleaner of houses. <coughs> they took three years to get pregnant. And she arrived from another hospital, unfortunately, at 20, 28 weeks. And we scanned the baby, and the brain was completely destroyed. Almost certainly, this baby had sudden megalovirus infection. There were holes in the whole, the whole brain was full of holes and calcifications and severe hydrocephalus. I was telling them that this baby is going to be severely handicapped. And they didn't want to believe it. They said, they were looking at me with a, with a great suspicion. And they were asking me whether they should go back to Moldavia uh, to their doctor there to give their opinion. I, I said, I know Moldavia because last month we gave them two machines to start doing scans. So you can go if you want, but whatever they tell you is irrelevant. So if I had told those women that we want to cut her right leg and that her baby would survive and be well, she would have cut both of the legs at the same time. So are we abusing the desire of women to do anything sometimes to save their baby and we are playing ourselves? because we like playing in medicine often, possibly. And that is why we have ethical committees, that is why there's a lot of scrutiny before you try new things, at least nowadays, not in the past. And when you do studies, you need to do trials to prove whether it is beneficial or not. There was a trial uh, from Philadelphia, and they showed that it is beneficial. You are reducing the risk of uh, lower limb weakness and perhaps the risk of urinary incontinence. So there was a trial. Um, but still, these babies will not be perfectly normal. For other conditions, like the anemic baby that would otherwise die and you give it a blood transfusion and they survive there well, um, the base of diaphragmatic hernia, which would have died and now survive, they grow up and they are well. So for many of the conditions, they are okay. We are, we, we are preventing them from dying and they are well. But for other conditions, I also question the value of it, of what we are doing. Yeah. Other questions? It's quite hot in here, isn't it? I think it's because we're right under those spotlights. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, Thank yes. you very much. Um, this one was amazing. Thank you. Um, have there been any new genetic risk factors identified? Yeah. In the last so you're right. Thank you. Um, thanks to the Field Medicine Foundation, um, have now spent one million pounds, because we have a, a big database. All women that come to us for the last 30, 20 years, we take a blood sample and we store it. And that is costing us about 700,000 pounds a year. The last year, thanks to Ukraine, the price went up by 300,000 pounds because of the electricity costs. 
Um, so we have now all of these samples. So I am collaborating with geneticists to compare the genetic profile of women that developed preeclampsia from the women that did not. It is almost certainly not a proper, um, as we understand, like thalassemia, one in four, or some other genetic diseases, one in two. It's going to be polygenic. So, but we will find out. I, I hope that in the next three months we will have some data. Yeah. George? Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the amount of data that you mentioned the problems with meta analyses. Yes, and are you a meta analyst? Uh, no, no, but <laughs> I, I, rely on, I, I rely a lot on. It's a very cheap way nowadays. Anybody that cannot do research, they <laughs> download from the internet some cheap software, often free. They ask the, uh, the librarian, they may give her some kebab or <laughs> one packet of baklava to do a, 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 a search of the database. They give them to them and they produce these two by two tables and they put them in and that is the ultimate uh, uh, level of evidence without critically evaluating each study. Yeah. And, and, and to me, it is setting science back. Another thing in relation to, pre to preeclampsia, there's a guy called, um, well, I forgot, I'm getting a bit old, uh, from South Africa, who has 52 publications on meta-analysis in the Cochrane database. Thank God they stopped funding them this year so it will die. Because for many aspects of medicine, it, it pushed things back. Um, so he, they, they did 13 studies of giving calcium to women. And there were some studies from Paraguay, 30 patients, Uruguay, another 20. And that's how 11 of the 13 studies were. And those showed a lot of benefit. And then there were two studies, one on um, 8,000 women and another on 4,500 women. And they showed no benefit at all. So here you have, if you add the two studies, they contributed 85% of the total of the, of the 15 studies. And those two proper studies showed no benefit whatsoever. And the other silly studies, they did. There's a technique in meta-analysis called, do you know about random? It's called random effects. It's a mafia. The random effects is where you click a button, the wrong button on the computer, and it equates the importance of a study of 8,500 with a study of 40 patients. They almost become the same. So suddenly, you have two proper studies that show no benefit, and you have 11 silly studies, and those are pulling the data into a major benefit of a 55% reduction. This guy is then part of those nice people that have extremely good salaries. Um, they live in beautiful houses. They don't speak French. They don't need to speak. Um, and they live in Geneva. It's called the WHO. <laughs> <laughs> and this organization then has as an advisor the guy that did this meta-analysis. And that becomes a major recommendation by the WHO. Completely wrong. Completely wrong. A month and a half ago, we had a, a meeting, Zoom meeting, and they brought me along by accident, some important people, with Bill Gates. Because Bill Gates wants to save humanity and he thinks that he can save humanity with various gimmicks, computer gimmicks, from American companies. And we sat down, and they gave me three minutes to talk. And I talked about aspirin. They talked about the problems of, Af of Africa. And they were talking about fleet to PLGF ratio and the development of highly sophisticated antibodies that they showed in monkeys can reduce fleet because fleet has endothelial dysfunction and that is the cause of preeclampsia. Yeah, you can do that. 
or you can buy aspirin from the local petrol station and give it to them. <laughs> I was given three minutes, and they gave the others one and a half hours. Ah. That's why I was frustrated and I spoke for an hour and a half tonight. <laughs> 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 yeah. But what was your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's great to As non specialists, sometimes it's easier to rely on a consensus given by a meta analysis that's yes. so far yeah. from apparently seemingly good scientists. Um, and they may be good meta analysis, but my, the question is like, how do we as non specialists find pioneering work like yours and not maybe? blindly look at meta analysis because it's also, I think, a kind of anti-establishment skeptical, where it's like anti-vax, climate denialism, that kind I'm of I'm not thing. one of those. I know, I know. I had vax, I had five, six, <laughs> six <laughs> COVID. Uh, yes. But I mean, like, a lot of people, a lot of like, those kind of skeptics self-style as anti-establishment and they rely on things like critiques on meta analysis and make people say, they say, oh, come to us, you can't yeah. trust the real scientists. Yeah. But how do we find a good I think that it's difficult. Um, it's very easy to take something that is, has been presented in the last 30 years as the ultimate level of medicine. But I think people like me are now challenging this ultimate level of medicine. And, and, and so in December, I'm, I'm having a meeting. I have it every year, the second and third of December. And there will be 1,500 people coming from 100 countries because I promised 20 years ago that until I die it would be the same 150 pounds including lunch and dinner and coffee and massage and everything else. <laughs> um, and you will present this data by the top mathematician of England and, 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 and begin to tell people to think. Don't take a lazy summary statistic but look, look begin to look at the evidence. So don't look at the meta-analysis that says calcium reduces the rate of preeclampsia by 55%. Just glance at it and say, but wait a minute. There were two proper studies of, that contributed 85% of the data and they showed nothing at all. And then you have the silly ones that drag the, the, the evidence down. It's much more difficult to fight those battles than that's the evidence quickly. But life is more complicated now, so I don't envy you that, uh, from my point of view, we showed that progesterone was useful. Progesterone was very cheap. And as part of my anti-Americanism, let me tell you what happened in America. After the progesterone was shown to be very effective, a company was given permission by the FDA the American organization, to market it. The cost of progesterone for the whole pregnancy to prevent preterm birth was $12. Once the American company received the right to market it, what do you think happened? 1200 dollars And I said, who is the terrorist? Al-Qaeda or that company? Because that company was responsible for the death of a lot more babies because the very group that would have benefited from progesterone could not afford to have it. Ten years later, the only thing that the FDA asked them to do is to do a trial to find out if it, it was not our progesterone, the vaginal progesterone, it was a very painful hydroxyprogesterone. It has a similar name, but it has nothing to do with the vaginal natural progesterone. It's intramuscular injections. They forced them to do another trial and find out if it works, and it did not work at all. If anything, it increased the rate. The first paper that showed the benefit was published in the New England Journal. The second paper took three years to be published in the American Journal of Perinatology that nobody has ever read or cared about. And then it took another four years for the various American institutions to say, stop using it. Why? Because they made billions of pounds, dollars, and they were supporting the research of the important professors in the institutions. I think there's two, should we take, can we take two questions together from you and then the two ladies? Yeah, we'll take them together and keep looking and ask them together. 
they can talk together. No. Well, <laughs> take one. We'll take them both together. You can answer them back, Ken. As a medical student, I was not interested in medicine. Um, <laughs> and if anybody asked me, what are you going to do? I thought that the most sexy thing to say that was seductive in parties was to say, I want to become a neurosurgeon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? You think that they are very delicate and very intelligent. The only problem is that of all the fields of medicine that I hated the most is neurology. <laughs> Learning each nerve, where the, the, it, I didn't go to any of the lectures. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then one day, a man that became a professor came to King's. And he, in his inaugural lecture, he spoke. It's interesting, the story of this man as well. He's Scottish. Like Paphos, it's the most primitive part of Cyprus. <laughs> it's, extremely, it's extremely poor. And because it's so very poor, the only way to escape in the past, now they have a lot of tourism and Hawaii restaurants, <laughs> was to educate yourself. That's why most of the good people of Nicosia and Limassol originate from Paphos, isn't it? <laughs> In Britain, the equivalent is called Scotland. That is why a lot of the British politicians and prime ministers, even that Blair, originated from Scotland. So there was a guy in Scotland called Ian Donald that during the Second World War, he was a gynecologist in Glasgow. During the Second World War, he was inspired by the submarines. What do the submarines do? They send waves of ultrasound to hit a moving object, and then the wave, when it is reflected back, changes in a way that reflects the speed of the object that you have hit. That's how the police catch me all the time. <laughs> um, and he thought that perhaps you can use that technique for the submarine called the fetus. So he started using this thing. And his best student was called Stuart Campbell. And like good people, he was completely arrogant. A woman was bleeding. And one of the causes of bleeding is a placenta previa, where the placenta is sitting on top of the cervix. And he did a scan, and he said, don't worry, there's no placenta previa. He stuck his fingers in the vagina, to examine the baby, and the woman died from a hemorrhage. So what did they do? They sent him away from Scotland to Imperial College, to Queen, to Queen Charlotte's Hospital, and they locked him up in a room on his own with a machine. They didn't want him to see any patients, but he was brilliant in ultrasound, and he was the father of ultrasound in obstetrics. And this man was uh, appointed as a professor at King's. And he came to this inaugural lecture, and I was so inspired by the lecture that I asked him if I could stay with him uh, for three months. The reason why I stayed with him for three months is because I'm scared of flying. Medical students, like my daughter now, she's wondering whether she should go to Hawaii or Seychelles because they have three months in the end of their studies to go to a country to learn about the medicine of the Seychelles of Hawaii. Um, and I said, I cannot fly anywhere. Can I stay with you for three months? And then that was it. I mean, the, the, looking at the feeders, moving around, just inspired me, and that's it. So it was a historical accident. <laughs> The problem with England is that <clears throat> it's a country where the second, in the, the Second World War was won by this <coughs> giant called Churchill. 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 And the people came back, the ones that did not die for the, que the king and the flag and the country, they came back <coughs> and they voted against him. They voted for the most uninspiring person that you could possibly imagine. But that guy said, we have now died and we have survived. We now need social reforms for us not to continue to die. And they voted for the Labour Party. And that's how the national health system was introduced in England. The problem is, because like Cyprus, 
of the past, not anymore. Like Cyprus, being an island, they have a delusion of grandeur. They think that they are the center of the universe. And they have the delusion that they have the best healthcare system in the world. And to me, it's one of the worst healthcare systems in the world. But somehow, it's extraordinary how this population tolerate such a ridiculously low standard of care. There is not a single country in Europe where you can tell them, we dream one day that we will see people with cancer within six weeks or six months. We dream. You go to any village in Greece, and if you have cancer, they see you the next day. But in England, the population somehow tolerates this. So at, until there is social uprising against a, 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 an intolerance to the disgusting. I went in, I was taking chemotherapy, and I went in one day, I had severe abdominal pain, and they kept me in the casualty, and I'm very important, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> in my hospital. Six hours in the casualty department, and then somebody came to examine me, he said, I, I hate this job, I want to get out of here, and I want to become a GP. I said, great. Uh, what, 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 am I right? He said, yes. <laughs> he said, go home. He said, you are perfectly right. And I went home. It was Friday. And over the weekend, I was very unwell. I was, I was, it's the first time in my life, because I'm not alcoholic like many of you. <laughs> I was driving. I was driving home. I felt so unwell that for the first time in my life I did something disgusting. I stopped the car and I vomited in the street. So on Monday I said, this is not right. So I asked a friend of mine to do a scan. He said, Kipros, you have a perforated appendix. A 67-year-old man at that time, uh, three years ago, um, on chemotherapy, uh, perforated appendix, at 9 o'clock in the morning at King's College Hospital, and I, I, I told my friend, the professor of hematology, I said, look, uh, what's all this? Don't worry, Gibros. I will talk to the professor of surgery, and they will operate on you immediately because it's very dangerous for you. At midnight, they operated on me. And then, for two days, I stayed in the recovery room because there was no, there was no bed for me to go to. And in the recovery room, I can't stand, I have to have a shower every day. And, and there was nothing. So I went to the toilet, and I took a bottle of um, water that they gave me, and, and I took a shower in the toilet. Where in Greece, in Albania, would you tolerate this? But in England, they do. We are question was what? <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I thank you for, for staying. Coming.